that that was that exchange was was great for an American um, to listen to because um, you know, regulation as as an issue is so much further along um, in in Europe than it is uh, in the U.S. and self regulation is pretty much what we have um, in the U.S. which. Um, now with maybe a little bit of public opinion pressure and probably not much congressional pressure um, on um, Facebook, Twitter, and others, Google. Um, uh, as other speakers have said, it, 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 um, it's a pleasure um, to be invited to um, participate here. And I, and I, I thought there was an unusually um, strong uh, uh, and a welcoming note as I walked into the building and saw, you'll know, pardon my pronunciation, but uh, Eterum um, um, Pulitzer, because um, Joseph Pulitzer, as you know, um, uh, was a, a, a Hungarian who migrated to the U.S., um, established uh, one of the most important newspapers in the country, um, in the New York world, um, and as his um, legacy and his will uh, established not only the Pulitzer Prizes that are world famous, but the Columbia Journalism School that employs me. Um, and I work in Pulitzer Hall, so I'm, I feel like I'm sort of home um, uh, once again. Um, um, I'll try to keep my comments um, brief. I kept crossing sentences out as I was listening, and other people said what I wanted to say anyway. So um, I, I want my, this will be an American perspective. I'm mostly going to talk about the U.S. I don't think what I'm saying is distinctive to the, the U.S. It's just where my knowledge is. Um, and I want to say that despite all the importance of the technology-driven changes uh, in journalism today, um, that those quite powerful and quite radical changes are and I would argue will be um, incomplete. Um, and that much of what we're calling legacy in journalism persists and its spirit uh, persists and its impact persists. Um, and, and that's really what I want to talk about. But, um, and in some ways, um, I would suggest that the most important journalism, um, um, this is a uh, question uh, Alberto implicitly raised. I mean, how much information do we have? Um, so, solid research on the impact of the disinformation. It's out there, to be sure. It may have had quite important impact in specific cases, um, um, but it would be good to have more more data on that than we do. Um, uh, but there's one place where we have quite good um, evidence of impact, and that's the impact of um, rather traditional and rather conventional, even though it's online sometimes, uh, these days and most of the time, uh, impact of um, investigative reporting and just regular old reporting. Um, and, I started thinking about this when, somewhat belatedly, I saw the Steven Spielberg film, um, The Post. Um, and if you've seen it, it's a story of journalism in the U.S. in 1971. Um, and uh, it focuses on the Washington Post, but the Post's effort to uh, catch up with the New York Times, its arch rival, um, uh, in publishing the Pentagon Papers, uh, the 
multi-volume secret, top, uh, top secret report um, on the history of the Vietnam War that was released to the, um, to the New York Times by um, a military intelligence specialist, uh, Pentagon uh, employee, Daniel Ellsberg. Um, New York Times published it, um, the nation, the world paid attention, and the Washington Post was lagging behind. Um, so that, that's what the film is about. But what, as I watched the film, I thought, wait, that's 47 years ago. What are the two most important news organizations in 2018 in covering the Trump administration? Huh. It's the New York Times and it's the Washington Post. Now, that seemed to me quite in, important um, and, and to be remembered with um, and, and to be, um, what, applauded uh, at a moment when all the attention is on Facebook um, or Twitter or something else. Um, I can put this another way. I'll give you a list of names. Um, they're not, well, one of them is fairly famous, but the others are not all that famous. But the names are Michael Flynn. He's the famous one. Um, he, he was, for a brief time, the National Security Advisor uh, to uh, the President. Tom Price, he was, for a somewhat longer time, the Secretary of uh, Health and Human Services, one of the major um, administrative divisions of the federal government. Brenda Fitzgerald, anyone know Brenda Fitzgerald? Um, uh, she, she was, for a very brief time, the uh, Trump appointee to head the Centers for Disease Control, uh, which, uh, among other things, is responsible for uh, the, the anti-tobacco efforts of the federal government. And, um, he last a week, I'm not sure, Anthony Scaramucci, who was the President's Director of Communications. Now, what happened to those four people and why aren't they still working for President Trump? The media happened to them. Um, uh, the Washington Post uh, uh, followed and cut covered Michael Flynn very carefully and his connections with um, uh, Russians in the um, during his during the, the Trump campaign uh, that came out largely through Washington Post reporting, although others participated as well. Um, then uh, Tom Price, uh, for reasons that only he can answer, decided he would not use conventional um, uh, commercial jets and go into meetings around the country but uh, private jets that would be um, paid for by the American taxpayer. Um, there, uh, that, that information came out thanks, uh, thanks to Politico, um, a, not entirely, but largely uh, online uh, operation. Um, it was a complicated story. Politico was willing to devote two reporters to it. Uh, they report they spent about a thousand hours uh, on that covering this because it wasn't so easy to find where these charter jets took off from, where they landed, who was on it. They, they went to different airports to see him get out of an airplane. Um, and it took them several months. Uh, but the result was he's no longer working in the federal government. Um, Brenda Fitzgerald, it turns out, while head of the Centers for Disease Control, which whose domain is health, and in particular tobacco, uh, was trading in tobacco stocks. Um, Politico discovered that as well, um, and she was gone the next day. Um, and then Anthony Scaramucci, um, sort of did himself in by talking with a reporter from the New Yorker 
it was on the record, he was um, uh, apparently used every foul word in the language to describe other members of the close associates of President Trump. Um, and he was soon gone. Now, um, Politico, responsible for two of those four stories, is a, a digital era um, uh, news organization, and quite an interesting one, and quite a large one, in fact, so several hundred um, reporters and other and editors and so forth. Um, but um, in, in favor of my argument that the conventional media are still important, uh, Politico was started by two Washington Post reporters, um, and they made quite quite a good show of it. Um, so, yes, there's an uncountable amount of talk online, from email to Facebook to Twitter, the comments the readers post to an uncountable number of websites. The explosion of communications offers astonishing benefits, including to reporters. But in this galaxy of information and commentary, how much do non-professionals produce that leads powerful individuals and powerful corporations and, uh, to feel forced to respond? Um, and I think the answer is, is that there's little or no impact, whereas uh, the conventional media, at least leading conventional media, that do uh, invest, uh, even in economically sour times, uh, in investigative reporting, and will put two or more reporters on a story for months at a time, uh, they have real impact. So we talk about clicks and we talk about reach, but there's another way of talking about uh, the, the role of the media in society, and that is, do you make a difference? Do you change policy or personnel in major places? I'll come to one more a little later. Um, for me, the source book for thinking through jur journalism's democratic role remains Walter Lippmann's Public Opinion from 1922. Uh, there Lippmann observes that journalism is like the beam of a searchlight that moves restlessly about, bringing one episode and then another out of darkness into vision, a line much quoted. Um, I think the more important line came just before it. Um, the sentence immediately before that sentence um, is a short one. The press is no substitute for institutions. So th that, that little sentence um, bulks larger and larger when you think about um, Trump's America, Brexit era Britain, Orban's Hungary, Air against Turkey, Netanyahu's Israel, and so on and so forth. Um, an independent judiciary, the rule of law in general, a civil service loyal to an oath of office and not to an incumbent prime minister or president, and an independent press dedicated to verifiable truth and protected by civil liberties enforceable by law. Um, you need institutions to make any of that happen. Um, and that's one thing about journalism that I think the journalism I want to uh, defend and I want to, uh, and that I admire in particular. Um, that journalism can and does dig up facts or have facts handed to them sometimes that once put by news organizations out into the public in broad circulation creates conditions that powerful public figures are forced to respond to. Um, th that's one point I want to make. I want to make an another point with another example. Um, one tiny decision uh, in one news story. Um, this is a, a news story by Richard pa Perez Pena, New York Times reporter, October 19th, not front page. Um, the headline was, Second Federal Judge Blocks the Third Revision of the 
travel ban. This was the, the ban on uh, immigrants from Muslim countries, or majority Muslim company, countries, that uh, Trump had enacted as a, an executive order. It did not have to go through the Congress. But it did have to abide by constitutional law. Um, and, um, and a lot of judges seem to think it didn't meet that standard. So it's a 17 paragraph story. I'm going to read you all of it. Um, it seems to me scrupulously, quite in fact, boringly fair. Um, it explained that Judge Derek Watson of Hawaii, the first judge to rule that the third travel ban was arguably illegal, held that it violated the 1965 federal immigration statute prohibiting dis discrimination based on national origin and he therefore issued a temporary res um, restraining order. A judge in Maryland, Theodore Chang, found travel ban three arguably illegal and constitutional as well as on statutory grounds and he granted an injunction for a definite period. And that, that was a, the recent event that led to this story. So, Paris Pena states all of that in flat, emotionless prose. Um, a first sign that he's probably a professional. Uh, in a second mark of professionalism, he quotes both one of the plaintiffs in the Maryland case uh, supporting Judge Chang's decision and also a Justice Department spokesman criticizing the judge's decision. All that standard. It was in the fifth paragraph that I found something that struck me as a little odd. Um, uh, Pierce Pena says both of these district judges and their, and their decisions would, would go to the Supreme Court later. Um, both of these district judges ruled against the Trump travel ban. They had been appointed by President Barack Obama. That's a fact. The question is, why does Perez Pena mention it? Um, um, it's just sort of it's it's apparent almost parenthetical it's just just a, a little clause um, uh, the district judges both appointed by President Barack Obama had ruled against an earlier attempt and so on it goes on for another 50 words in the same rather poorly written sentence sentence but those six words both appointed by President Barack Obama they're the only set words in the sentence that are not about what just happened yesterday in Judge Chang's court. So why? Why does Ferris Pena interrupt himself to put that in? Well, obviously it gives readers sympathetic to the Trump travel ban bans an explanation outside the law for why these judges ruled as they did. Uh, he doesn't say uh, that the journalist, that the judges were guided more by their li presumably liberal political preferences rather than by a fair-minded interpretation of the law, but he equips readers to entertain that possibility. He answers a question that some readers might have had in mind. I, for one, had that question in mind. Who appointed these guys? Um, I was hoping it had been George W. Bush uh, to show that the right interpretation is their interpretation and even a Republican appointed judge would know it. Well, I was not so lucky given my uh, uh, political opinions, but still, it, 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 uh, someone with, who is a Trump fan would have been empowered by those six words. He could have inserted other non-immediately happened the day before kinds of things. For instance, uh, he could have told us that Judge Watson is a native Hawaiian, the son of a police officer, the first in his family to attend college, a graduate of Harvard Law School. His nomination was confirmed by a vote in the Senate 94 to 0. He could have told us that Judge Chang is the son of Taiwanese immigrants, another Harvard Law School graduate. From 2009 to 2014, the Deputy General Counsel for the Department of Homeland Security. 
this is probably someone who knows something about homeland security as opposed to the president who doesn't. Um, and um, that might have been relevant to, to this story. But um, Paris Pena made a choice, and the choice was to recognize that in a polarized political world, readers would likely be most interested to know, to know who appointed them. The added six words efficiently state the fact they recognize, as anyone must, that political orientation is, whether we like it or not, a factor in judicial decisions. And in this case, they're also a demonstration of something about the New York Times, a demonstration of fair-mindedness. Do we think that New York Times is a little bit unsympathetic to President Trump? I think that's a fair assumption. Um, and in this case, they are nonetheless saying, you might find reason to think these judgments were unfair, that they were part of a witch hunt, say, against um, President Trump. Acting in a fair-minded way is exactly what news stories, not editorials, but a news story in a leading newspaper is supposed to do. But the negative here is that the that, that is that, that there's something I find uncomfortable about that particular use of the six words. Um, that it insinuates that judges ignore the law and follow their political preferences. It's uh, that's cynical. Is it true? It could be true. Uh, is it always true? It is not always true. Um, Ask Dwight Eisenhower if, if he was glad he appointed Earl Warren as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. No. Um, uh, or or, or um, ask Richard Nixon if he thought he made a great choice um, in, in uh, appointing Harry Blackman, a lifelong Republican, um, to the, be on the Supreme Court. No, he was very unhappy with Mr. Blackman, Justice Blackman, who wrote the decision um, making abortion or some kinds of abortion constitutional. I don't know if Perez Pena made the right decision. Uh, I do feel confident that he wrote not as a liberal or a conservative, uh, but as a professional. And this is the professionalism that President Trump and others on the right now dismiss as fake. Um, although uh, it's only fair to say uh, that many on the left have made similar charges over the years against the mainstream media, arguing that they are political, centrist, uh, or even right centrist uh, in many respects. The, the journalism I want to defend, and I don't want to go on too long, um, I, I do want to say something about it that that one of the most important things in my lifetime about American journalism, and I have some evidence this is true elsewhere in, in the world, in, in the Netherlands and in Sweden and, and in Britain, and in, you know, that it's in the mid to late 1960s that journalism added to its um, kind of he said, she said, narrowly defined uh, objectivity. If you quote a Democrat, quote a Republican. If you, if you quote Labour, quote a Tory, and, and so forth. Um, uh, that emerged in the early 20th century. Um, it kind of hit its, its high point in the 1950s and into the early 1960s, and then it changed. People said, that's not good enough. Uh, people in and outside journalism said, that's not good enough. Um, we, we need to be more critical. And it added to that earlier form of objectivity a substantial increase in and celebration of investigative reporting and a more aggressive and independent spirit in the news business. Um, as virtually all authorities attest, news coverage of government, politics, and society um, opened up in the 19, late 1960s and 1970s. Um, and, and why that happened? Well, it was the 60s, right? Um, something was happening in the culture. 
it's something was happening in the culture, I think, and in cultures around the world um, that made people um, willing and even eager to accept the notion that the emperor might have no clothes. Um, now, when news stories with some frequency arise from enterprise reporting, uh, not necessarily investigative, but where the journalists don't wait for the politicians to set the agenda, but set the agenda themselves. Um, at this point, uh, we get not just a flat account of what happened yesterday, um, but something more analytic, something more critical. And evidence is clear that in the U.S. Uh, political reporting from the 1960s to the 1990s, journalism became more critical and more negative about presidential candidates, Republicans and Democrats, both. Um, what is difficult is all this was happening at the same time and in a way out of the same growingly skeptical culture um, that made us doubtful not, not just believers in fake news, but made all of us, to some extent, doubtful about truth. Um, uh, the, the, the piece of this uh, that I, I think is a, is a wonderfully important bit of humor or self-irony comes from uh, the fact-checking site, one of the earliest fact-checking sites in the U.S., um, PolitiFact. Um, they have as their symbol the truth o meter. Um, and they, 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 uh, it's on some of their publications and it's probably on their website. The truth o meter. What, what's a truth o meter? Um, well, they have a picture of it, but it doesn't exist. That's their point. It doesn't exist. They tell you as much as they can um, about how they check facts. But um, they, uh, they, there's a linguistic piece of this too. They, uh, when when there is disagreement on the staff about how to rate a particular statement by a particular politician, um, they have what they call a star chamber meeting. Um, okay, that goes back to 1600s in in Britain. Um, uh, it, it's it's. Uh, they are, they're laughing at themselves as they say, we are going to collectively figure out what's true here, or how true it is, because they do make gradations. Um, they say, you know, that's, they, they're saying to the public and to themselves, that's ridiculous. Nobody can do that. Uh, and at the same time, they're saying, we're human. Uh, that's the best we do. That's how science works, too. Yeah, they have a few more rules than we do, uh, and they've developed a few more procedures over time, and they've subcontracted it to some extent to um, uh, machinery. But mostly, um, they arrive at a consensus as best as they can. That's what we're doing, as best as we can. The thing that's important about that is they keep trying. Um, they, they are devoted to the notion of truth. So, a closing line. Um, in journalism, one way to define professionalism uh, is that professional journalists follow the story. They follow the story rather than following their political preferences. And they follow the story with an eye to accuracy and fairness. And that's why Mr. Flynn, Mr. Price, Ms. Fitzgerald, and Mr. Scaramucci are not serving in the Trump administration. It's also why Harvey Weinstein uh, may serve time in prison and no longer has the power at this point to destroy the careers of women who do not submit to his sexual advances. Um, and how do we know about Harvey Weinstein? Well, certainly, in part because women were willing to blow the whistle on him. But many of those women had blown the whistle only insofar as they could make 
uh, an agreement with Mr. Weinstein himself um, and receive payment for the injury he had done them as long as they didn't say anything publicly. And they didn't say anything publicly until the New York Times, founded 1851, and the New Yorker, founded 1925, went after Mr. Weinstein. Um, that's journalism with real power, and um, I think even in its old-fashioned form, it still has it. Thanks. Thank you very much. We might have some time for two or three comments. We are running out of time. John is one. I have a comment. And who is third again? I'm sorry about that. Okay, two is enough. We are running out of time. Uh, may I start with my comment? I, I missed one name. That is uh, Sebastian Gorka, the Hungarian uh, oh. security advisor to Trump. Thank you. Well, Thank you. Many of us wait, uh, waited for, for his name, but uh, so the list is longer. Uh, and uh, maybe a comment that it's, it's very exciting that uh, New York Times and Washington Post still have a strong influence on uh, US politics. Unfortunately, in the Hungarian case, that's not the situation anymore. We don't have time to discuss it, maybe we can react to it. Uh, John, that's you. Well, these were golden words, uh, like much of what Michael Schuster writes. Um, I was. I agree very much with them. I wanted to add just one thing about journalists who actually want to say this happened and want to provide some kind of evidence for it and spend days, months uh, looking for it. And that is two things. One, that the impact that you describe journalism as having depends upon, seems to be, two other things. Uh, one is that um, you have to have a civil society which can be shocked. Rather than, I mean, I saw this when I was bureau chief for the FT in, in, in Moscow after the fall of communism, rather than um, a society which, by and large, when things were revealed, said, well, yeah, that's, the part. that's what they always do, or even that's what I would do if I'd been in their position. And it, it didn't have the power to shock. It's to a limited extent true in other countries. It's, I've noticed it a bit in Italy, not entirely, but a bit. Um, so we need a civil society which can be shocked and continue to be shocked and put pressure upon government, and we need a government which can be ashamed mm -hmm. or which, which can be constrained to take some action over a, a large revelation of some kind. In other words, the, the government cannot simply ignore it as uh, many governments in authoritarian countries, but most governments in authoritarian countries, and some in semi-authoritarian, semi-democratic countries do. In this country, as I understand it, there's a fair amount of evidence, though I don't know if anybody has really done a proper investigative report, that the Prime Minister has amassed a great deal of money uh, from who knows where. But there's no consequence to it yet, or there may be, in some time, his family says no. no. Uh, yeah. Maybe, but there isn't yet, and he won the last election with an even larger majority than he had before. So, in many societies, that is lacking. So, it's it, it's investigative journalism which is which takes care to make a proper, well-rounded case which can take a long time. It's a civil society which can be shot, and a government which can be shamed and constrained to do something about it. I just respond. Um, uh, yeah, I, I agree with um, everything uh, John said, especially about how both of my words are. But, um, uh, the, I, I don't think uh, the distinction between being um, for uh, officials to be um, capable of embarrassment uh, or shame and, and just being constrained, I think it's an important one that you make. I don't think my president um, uh, is capable of shame. Um, he is shameless. Um, and uh, I, if you heard me talking 
when I was in Europe making a couple of talks or just talking with friends here in the spring of 2016, I assured people, don't, don't worry, he can't be elected. So you should, probably shouldn't listen to anything I say. Um, but uh, a lot of people thought he could not possibly be elected. And not, not, now we know that um, um, illiberal democracy is um, uh, a phrase that is, we are not immune to uh, in the U.S. Um, the, the, in the case of Hungary, which I'm still learning about, um, uh, I, I, I don't know what to... Um, what to say. I mean, yes, there's no Washington Post or New York Times. Um, 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 there, there's some opinions I understand that it circulates online that's um, uh, open and critical, um, but doesn't reach very far. Um, I, it does strike me, just for my two cents worth, that there, there are stories to be written here that would um, that could open things up. It seems to me, without being forcing a reporter to be shut down. Um, I, maybe they are being written, I, and I just I I don't read Hungarian um, interviews with. The, well, there aren't very many um, um, migrants in Hungary, but. Um, there are some, and maybe, I mean, in, in the U.S. you see stories periodically about um, this illegal Mexican kid um, saved the, the, the infant on the fourth floor of this building that was burning. I mean, um, does that change opinion? They say, well, I think he was an exception. Um, yeah, maybe you, you can... You can resist that, but it's it gives another side to the frightening, frightening migrant story. Um, those sorts of uh, what I call social empathy stories. Um, they're not investigative reporting. Um, they're human interest stories, and they, over time, it seems to me, can make a difference. I can't show that anyone got fired because of them, but um, I. I there are lots of stories like that out there.